Well, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to Bite-Sized Corrosion. In every session of Bite-Sized Corrosion, we try to break down another aspect of corrosion-related information into hopefully interesting and informative little nuggets of information. And we hope that you'll leave us having learned something new and eager to continue your journey in understanding corrosion a little more. Now, we're really excited to be starting a new three-part series today, which we've titled Galvanizing in Perspective. Now, although galvanized steel products are used all over the place, I certainly don't know enough about galvanizing. And I'm really thrilled to be welcoming our guest for the series, Mr. Rob White. Now, Rob is well known to many. His uh, university career spanned uh, several years ago between the UK and South Africa. He is a professional engineer in the UK, and he's a past president of the Corrosion Institute, as well as a gold medal recipient and an honorary life member. So he has this wealth of experience in corrosion and even more than that in zinc. He's worked throughout the UK, South Africa, in the Middle East, the Far East, South America. So well-traveled, I guess, might be his second name. He's been tremendously involved with galvanizing activities and within the industry. Rob has also represented our local industry on lots of government advisory bodies. And I think that this wealth of experience and expertise is ours to enjoy for the next little while. So a warm welcome to you, Rob. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. And thanks for the opportunity. Oh, it's a pleasure. Rob, as I alluded in my intro, despite the fact that I've been fortunate enough to visit a galvanizing plant many, many, many years ago, I feel that I actually know very little. And so I wondered if we could start at the beginning answering the question, what is galvanizing and is it different from organic coatings? Yeah, let me try and put some things into perspective, seeing as that's the title of the suite of talks. And I think in any history of galvanizing wouldn't be complete without some background actually on zinc itself. And to try and show how that has moved in the world, I'd like to think that everybody knows that brass has been around for a thousand years. But zinc actually as a metal is relatively recent because zinc has the unfortunate property that whilst it melts at around 420 degrees, it boils at just over 900. So early smelters of metals couldn't keep the zinc as it simply boiled away. And in fact, brass was produced by heating zinc oxide, which in those days was called philosopher's wool. This was mixed with charcoal, covered with copper. And the idea was that you heat everything up and the zinc permeates into the copper and eventually you end up with brass. And brass was really uh, used because people liked this enduring gold color. Now, commercial zinc production started in England in the mid 1700s in Bristol at the Warming Works by a character called William Champion. And that's certainly a story in itself. And if we look at galvanizing itself, India never had a Bronze Age, but went straight into a steel age as steel making was perfected very early on for making weapons. And there are reports of animal armor, which basically would have been leather, being covered with zinc coated steel. But modern use of galvanizing dates from a presentation to the French Royal Academy in 1742 by a character called Malawan. And he demonstrated that steel could be coated by dipping into molten zinc. Later mm -hmm. in the century, uh, Luigi Galvani had the funny uh, experiment that I'm sure everybody did at school, or if you didn't do it at school, you were given the grisly video, which is the twitching frog's legs when you connect copper to iron. And it was supposed to show that electricity was generated in the muscles. But actually, of course, as we know, Volta eventually showed that it was the connection of the similar metals through a liquid that generated the electricity. And the term galvanized was coined to indicate a spark to action. And that's really why galvanize, as the word, has uh, become so embodied within the English language. But the practical use of galvanizing is attributed to a character called Sorrel, and he was granted a patent nearly 100 years later in 1836. And what becomes quite interesting then is how quickly the idea of galvanizing took off. A patent was granted to a guy called William Crawford a little before Sorrel's invention for corrugated steel. And of course, oh. corrugations are what give the steel its strength in terms of not just a roofing product, but for cladding. And uh, it becomes quite interesting then because 
a guy called Henry Palmer then took these eight by four sheets, which is really all you could handle. And these were dipped into molten zinc. And the whole process took off to the extent that even by 1850, there was 50,000 tons of zinc consumed in England, just on corrugated sheets. Now, to put that in perspective, that's about two thirds of the size of the South African zinc market today. And when people say, well, where did all this product go? If you look virtually anywhere where the British Empire was around the world, you'll find all these buildings. So if you go to Goldbury City, you go to Kimberley. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went some years ago to a place called Tempe, which is just outside of Bloemfontein, looking at the army base there. And there were corrugated sheds there that really were, they were put together in the 1890s. And they were still standing from the days of the Boer War. So, I mean, it is absolutely fascinating in terms of the history of Zing. So Indeed. in terms of, well, what is the difference and what is it not? It, it's, the thing is, because you're dipping it in steel into molten zinc, you end out with a metallurgical bond. And that's right. the key difference. There is actually a reaction between the steel and the zinc. And it's a series of alloys. And what people tend to forget is that because of this reaction, it tends to be thicker over pointy parts. So edges mm. tend to have better covering than the flat surface, which is almost the opposite of what of you have paint coating. organic coating. So you don't need anything like stripe coating. And it's actually applied in a controlled environment. I mean, that's the one of the things, which is, so if there is the odd mishap, you can really strip it and easily regalvanize the process. So it's actually a series of alloys, but it's an, an inorganic process, not an organic process. And that's right. a fundamental difference. That's so interesting because we don't tend to think of galvanizing as a coating. And, and in some regards, of course, it is. But in some regards, we're actually, from what you've just said, making a, a new metal or a series of new metals sitting on top of the steel and ending up with pure zinc on the outside. You know, what people tend to forget is that the outer surface of a galvanized, uh, a piece of galvanized steel is actually pure zinc. So it's relatively soft. But you have this series of alloys from literally from iron, iron with a bit with a little bit of zinc, then with a bit more zinc and a bit more zinc. And without going into uh, phase diagrams and looking at things <laughs> such as eutectics, all we really need to understand is that these various alloy layers give the galvanized coating its durability, its hardness, and everything else. And maybe it's worth going through the actual you know, the process or the different methods, and we can have a look at, uh, you know, what's important. That's very interesting. And I think, so when you're talking about galvanizing through today, I'm understanding that you're talking about what is sort of classically formally termed hot dip galvanizing, because of this contact with this liquid zinc, would that be correct? Yes, yes. that's exactly correct. And I think for those who want to listen through the series, and we always say on a good TV series, you've got to leave people with something so they want to uh, watch the next episode. What is very interesting, um, and a lot of people don't seem to appreciate this before we even go into the process, is that after Sorrel had put his patent together, there are obvious limitations. One of the limitations is the size of the zinc kettle. So if you can't get it in the kettle, by definition, you can't actually galvanize it. And he thought, well, are there different ways in which you could look at this? And it is interesting that literally within 20 years of him coming up with the process of galvanizing, not just the dipping into the molten zinc, but how you make a quality coating. Um, he came up with a concept of cold galvanizing, which was essentially using um, zinc oxide or more accurately an oxychloride for those people who are listening and talk about inorganic zinc uh, paints. And that predates not only the first inorganic you know, zinc coatings that were through a lady called Leclerc in France, but to show how people, and you, I mean, you know from discussions we've had in the past how uh, passionate I am about pre and post Google. Um, and if you go into pre Google, what is interesting is this is not new news. So, a character called George Smith in the USA, nearly a hundred years later, patented. The exact product that Sorrel had done had produced a hundred years before. 
And in fact, you can say that it was really a character called Victor Nightingale in Australia who sorted out the conundrum, which is how do you get this to be sensible in terms of durability and to stick? And it was actually moving towards using synthetics rather than an oil-based paint. And right. I think that too, too few people appreciate the background that sorrel actually is the link, not just to the hot dip galvanizing processes, we understand it, but to gold, cold galvanizing. And I've said on many occasions, I am on record as saying that people need to move away from this fascination that there is no such thing as cold galvanizing. There is cold galvanizing, it's there in the patent. But we're really here now to talk about the hot dip process. Well, then I think this is a good time to say, okay, how does it work? What do we need to do? I've got a piece of steel. How do I get it to have a Zinclair on it? This is a video that I prepared a few years ago as part of a, a workshop that I, I ran in Bali. Essentially, you have the steel and the steel is cleaned. So it's degreased and it's acid cleaned. Um, it's then dipped into a flex solution to ensure that there is, it is properly cleaned. And you end up with this flex coating. And from that, it is dried and it is then moved into molten zinc. And the reactions that occur are very interesting. They initially start off with um, a various uh, alloys being produced. And these alloys begin to build up. And what you will see here is what's called the delta alloy, the outer zeta alloy, and you can see this very slim, funny little R in reverse, which is the gamma alloy, which is really gives it this adhesion. And slowly, the outer um, zeta layer grows. And as it grows, you end out with uh, the total um, galvanized coating. And when you pull it out of the zinc, you end out with pure zinc on the outside surface. And you will see from this that, and this, Micrograph really shows that it is reasonably representative because that's a schematic. But you can see you've got the base steel, the gamma layer, the delta layer, the zeta layer, and then this outer uh, zinc layer. And what I'd like to draw to your attention is just really two things. The first is very obvious, which is the amount of, of iron becomes less as you move away from the steel surface. Um, but these are distinct layers. And if you look at the hardness, you will also see that the gamma layer uh, but more importantly, the delta layer is essentially harder than the base. Harder steel. than the steel. And in mm. fact, as a result of that, this is what gives the uh, a galvanized coating its durability in terms of uh, it will take a few hard knocks. I haven't gone through the, 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 as you move from process to process, really, because it's this finished coating that people need to be able to look at. That's so interesting um, that the hot dip actually imparts a tougher surface to the steel. I had never really thought about, I probably knew it, but I, I never really thought of it as being you know, so much harder and, and therefore actually really useful. <laughs> it is interesting from the perspective that because you have these unique alloys that are produced because of the actual process in the molten zinc, you end out with these, these hard alloys and they have pluses and minuses. I mean, the, the, the big positive, as I said, is it really becomes quite resistant to abrasion and also it, it, it can be chipped but it, it, it's quite a resilient coating. There, there are potential downsides, which is if you had a lot of flex, you could say, well, won't these things de adhere? And can't you then get flaking? And yes, you can get flaking, but there are methods of getting around this. And uh, if you look at, say, continuous galvanizing, continuous galvanizing is a, it, it's a completely different process. The process itself is the same, but really what you try and do is you try and stop those alloy layers building up. So as a consequence, you get the adhesion to the steel, but you end up with a relatively flexible, almost pure zinc uh, surface, which makes it a little softer, but it means you can bend it and therefore you can have an automobile or you can have steel coils that you could then process. Um, so there are different ways in which you can manage this, but in the what we call the general galvanizing industry, that process that I've just shown you is essentially what happens. And the true name of, the, of that process actually is a bit long-winded. It's the after fabrication batch hot dip galvanizing process. I just call it general galvanizing. It's a bit simpler. Yours is an easier name. I just wanted to ask a quick comment. Right at the start, you made a comment that the substrate needs to be dry. And I can imagine that's because water in this process would be quite a spectacular little 
splash. <laughs> it gets quite exciting. The fluxing process is always carried out in a, in a flux bath. And certainly in South Africa, for many, many years, a lot of plants had no drying process whatsoever. So it was all based on the heat. And as a result of that, the idea was that when you then put it into the molten sink, there is an, you can minimize the amount of excitement. But yes, you are quite right in that if the steel is very wet, as you would imagine, even the most unfit operator becomes quite fit quite quickly. And that people, uh, it's remarkable how people can run away from uh, splashing uh, molten metal. Um, but yeah, a well-managed process, you really don't get much in the way of zinc splashing. That's good to hear. Rob, I know previously and, and obviously with my corrosion bits of experience, we've now got zinc, we've got iron, we've got them together. We've got a less noble metal in contact with uh, our steel. We've put the zinc on. Are we just going to lose it all to corrosion? Is that how it's protecting the steel? Is that why we even do it? No, zinc is a reactive metal in the same way as chrome is a reactive metal. So essentially what happens is that it's, it's almost like a passivation process. There is a reaction between the zinc and the atmosphere, which is why most applications that you would come across tend to be atmospheric applications. And that is because the zinc immediately oxidizes to zinc oxide and eventually goes through a series of reactions. And you end up with this dark gray color after a period of time, which is essentially a carbonate of sorts. And that is what gives it the corrosion protection to the zinc itself. Now that slowly begins to disappear, um, but the service life of a zinc coated steel a galvanized coating or optic galvanized coating, general galvanizing, is quite well known in terms of the various environments and it's fairly linear. That's one of the big pluses. Mm -hmm. I know in the uh, last talk we'll go through the various standards and I think that will emphasize that point a little more as to why then it becomes easy to predict how it will perform. But it, you end out with the barrier protection which is the protection that the carbonate uh, layer provides. But in addition to that, of course, if there is any damage, then the zinc itself will actually sacrifice itself, form corrosion products similar to the corrosion products that would be formed over the normal zinc surface, so that any defects generally tend to be self-healing. And that is right. a big advantage of using optic galvanizing versus a normal organic coating. And that's a huge advantage. Right, and from your history lesson at the start, I mean, if you've seen galvanized structures that were built in the late 1800s in the free state, fairly benign environment, it does point to its longevity when it's used in the right location. And of course, choosing the right place to use the, the galvanizing is obviously something that, that it needs a lot of consideration. Now, you spoke about zinc being dark gray. What if that doesn't suit my color scheme? Can we change it? Yeah, I think that's a, a, a fair question in that you can have any color you want to find as gray. Um, and normally, uh, zinc or a galvanized coating, a, a general galvanized coating, is coated for corrosion, added corrosion protection, but you are right in that it can be done for aesthetic reasons as well. So if you're in a situation where you just don't like gray and you want bright red, I would hasten you to move towards an you know, organic pigment rather than organic pigment. But that's a, another story for another day. Um, but I do feel that, yes, you can then coat the general galvanized steel and you will get significantly longer life than you would think that you would get. And I say that because you don't get just the, if you like, the performance of the coating plus the performance of the slow corrosion of, of the galvanized or the, or the zinc coating, um, you don't, it's not an additive process. So it's not as if one plus one equals two. Okay. It's, it's quite easy to see that one plus one can equal three. And the reason behind that is because you do not get underfilm creep. So if there is damage in the coating, you'll find that it doesn't creep underneath. And for those of you who are probably, uh, 40s, you forget. Um, but for those who are younger than that, you wouldn't realize. But in the old days, certainly if you drove around Durban, it was always quite exciting because uh, a stone chip on a car, you got this sort of funny little craze where it was going underneath the, uh, the you could see the, the, the paintwork actually lifting. 
Mm. And the reason why you don't get that anymore is because essentially all auto body steels been galvanized. So the okay. coating that is on top cannot actually, you don't get any under film creep. So you get a big advantage in terms of putting a coating, the correct coating, sure, on top of uh, a, gal a general galvanized coating. Um, and as I said, you can also use a cheap and cheerful coating if you just don't like grey. It's a very benign environment. You can pick a coating quite easily and uh, work from that. Well, that, that always helps with the aesthetics. <laughs> this is so interesting, Rob. Thank you. It is lovely to look at something that we all encounter. I mean, we are all experienced with seeing, even if we don't actually recognize that we're seeing it, hop dip galvanized structures wherever we go, street lamp posts and um, obviously the corrugated roof sheeting. And it's good to get a little bit of a perspective of how it got there and why it's going to last. And that for me is quite encouraging to know that, that we are building some things that should last and that this is a process that helps that to happen. Yeah, I, I, I think the fact that it's, it's you know, the, the, the process is remarkably simple. Sure, there are complexities that make is the difference between an average coating and a good coating. And that doesn't matter whether it's a galvanized coating or an organic coating or heavy duty coating. We know that. But the process hasn't really changed for a number of years. Um, what has changed is that by adding different alloys into the zinc, we can end up with sort of different uh, appearances. We still get the gray of sorts. But the general performance is such that when you've had a structure that has stood for 100 years mm. and you think to yourself well will hot dip galvanizing or general galvanizing work in that environment i would suggest that generally unless you are somebody who is a little physically challenged you could probably walk within 200 meters of where you stand and you will see something that has been general galvanized structure and you can very rapidly see them whether it will or will not work in that environment and I think that has a huge plus as well, is that often we try and do accelerated corrosion tests and as new coatings come out, we tinker with this and we tinker with that. But the general corrosion performance of a hot dip galvanized coating hasn't really changed. So if it worked then, it will work now. And I think that, that gives a degree of comfort. Mm -hmm. And in fact, also there are a number of instances where guarantees are asked for as we know and it's quite easy to give those guarantees of performance yeah. because yeah. you have benchmarks that you can use as a reference that's very valuable and and just a as you say a useful on-site example of whether what you're recommending is going to work or not work well thank you rob this has been a very insightful discussion and i actually can't wait for the next two weeks to see how how far we can push this galvanizing and where we're going to take it